Hi, John Freeman here. So we're on rule number two of our 16 rules of investing in software-based businesses. And rule number one uh, being no rules. Rule number two is Moore's Law rules. So the simple investment conclusion here is, is, is this. Um, so we think it's actually very important to understand and to be continually mindful of the following. So all of the tremendous innovation and progress in software, the growth of the software industry, revenue, uh, the creation of all software-based businesses, um, you know, uh, were fed by a constant uh, cost constant growth in transistor density. So it's a rough proxy for computing capacity per unit, uh, per unit area, uh, per unit cost. Uh, ev uh, for, of, of more than 40% per year uh, since the first commercial transistor came out in 1954. So that cost constant growth of, uh, uh, of, of growth in computing capacity has been delivered to the software industry, uh, as a kind of a way to think about it, to the software industry by the semiconductor industry with remarkable consistency. Um, after the first integrated circuit or uh, IC or chip, uh, when all the transistors got to be put onto a single uh, block of silicon, uh, and the first commercially available one in 1964 had 120 transistors. So that was about one transistor per uh, square millimeter. Um, today, a chip of uh, similar size costing you know, a few hundred dollars, like it, it costed, like that chip cost in 1964. Uh, but that chip uh, today would feature over, you know, there's one actually features over 15 billion transistors, okay? Um, that's actually, uh, that might even be a little bit of a trailing edge. Um, uh, there might be even higher now, but 15 billion transistors as I, I think of 2020, that's a hundred million transistors per square millimeter. Uh, if you kind of think about it, that's, uh, that's, that's insane. So the very first time I heard the term Moore's Law, it was actually from my dad. So uh, if you'll please uh, indulge me um, as I give some uh, props to my pops, uh, my late father, Bucky Freeman, the director of research at the Army's Night Vision Electro Optics Labs for many years, uh, later designated uh, one of the designated chief scientists uh, for the Defense Department. Um, he first told me about Moore's Law in 1980. It's about five years after the term was first uh, coined by uh, Professor Carver Mead. Um, and it was after he came back from a series of meetings in Silicon Valley that uh, were set up to bring uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, and the defense industry as a whole, so we can better sync with the tech industry. So I remember his words really well. Um, so, you know, he, he would kind of squint his eyes and, you know, when he made uh, big sort of pronouncements like this, as he sometimes did, and kind of look off into the distance and he would say, you know, uh, anything compounding at that, uh, at that rate so often and so consistently is going to have a bigger impact than anyone expects. And I, I, I think it's really important to, to note the psychological uh, reference here that he was making, um, that he, he was always very interested in the, the impact of uh, group psychology on technology and vice versa. Um, so, and you know, and then he was sort of saying, son, you know, the, the future is going to be very different from the past, right? And uh, well, certainly uh, he's, he's absolutely prescient about that. Of course, um, you know, I, that that conversation, by the way, that, that where that quotation from my dad comes from was a conversation about uh, uh, talking about, you know, what do I want to do with my life and sort of, you know, what careers might make sense. And he was trying to nudge me into becoming a computer programmer and to go to school to do that, um, which advice, of course, uh, I ignored. And I didn't even think about Moore's Law again until, sure enough, of course, my first job, I'm trying to fix a database, uh, a bilingual database that keeps crashing uh, a, a Japanese and English uh, a database on a Macintosh, uh, mind you, um, and sort of the frustration of that of that uh, of that uh, experience put me uh, face to face very much with Moore's Law. I wish there was like you know you could feel the computer straining under the weight of the software, and you knew that you know in a couple of years it'd be balanced, it'd be, it'd be bailed out, and the software would probably run uh, without crashing. But at that time, certainly did not. Um, anyway, that frustration uh, pushed me out of becoming a hands you know doing anything uh, technology oriented from a hands-on perspective. After a couple of years of that, I had 
had enough and went on to uh, do uh, get into industry analysis and then of course equity analysis which I have been uh, active in for the past uh, almost 20 years now um, so uh, here's the definition of Moore's Law. So in 1965, in a 1965 article in Electronics Magazine, a, the Intel co-founder, Gordon Moore, so he made the following, um, what's called a predictive observation, that holding cost and uh, chip size constant, the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip doubles uh, every 18 months. So, and then in 1975, the Caltech professor who coined the term Moore's Law, uh, Carver Mead, um, that's when, so that's when he coined it. And at the same time, uh, Gordon Moore also extended his doubling pace because uh, it looked like it was a bit slowing down. So he extended the doubling pace to 24 months, but that held true. That held true for Intel uh, x86 CPUs until 2014, um, until TSMC took over the lead, and now uh, that is uh, now TSMC is the company that produces the the, great, the, the chips with the greatest uh, transistor densities first. Okay, so here is where we have Moore's law uh, uh, graphed out, um, and we have on the um, on the left uh, uh, in blue is the um, uh, uh, transistor density, right? Um, and then on, in the green, uh, on the um, on the right hand axis, you have uh, you have um, cost per transistor. So in order to have cost constant transistor density doubling every two years, that that means that the cost per transistor is halved every two years, right? So here we have the same data um, on transistor density and then paired with the uh, products that were made possible, basically the software that was made possible um, on the different hardware, uh, uh, different products with different sort of, uh, of uh, different transistor densities, uh, enabling different hardware form factors and, you know, and, and, and different kinds of software that can run on them. So um, there's some examples here to just to sort of illustrate the I don't know how foundational, I guess, the this exponential growth in transistor density uh, has has been for you know the progress that we see. So the the iPhone, for example, first came out right in 2007. Um, if it had been constructed in 1985 with the transistor density uh, of that time, with chips of you know the transistor density of that time, um, the phone would have been larger than a football field. Um, and actually, that's uh, apparent. That's actually just the mobile processor. Just the mobile processor would be the size of a football field. Right? That was not that long ago, right? Uh, if you consider that much uh, progress, right? Um, another one, you know, uh, the computational capacity required to render the Velociraptors, the first Jurassic Park movie, came from a network of 100 silicon graphics workstations, right? Uh, computing capacity that became available on a single notebook PC by 2005 and on your phone by 2012. Right. Um, and then what I like here is if you want to construct a data center with the computing and data storage capacity of today's hyperscale data centers, let's say from Amazon or Microsoft or, or Alphabet, you know, one of these massive data centers. But if you use the chips that were available uh, with the transistor densities uh, that were available in 1978, uh, that data center would be larger than the state of Connecticut. Uh, the common so so to say nothing of course of the power consumption uh that uh, uh that would be required so here's a great quote from uh nathan mirvold he was the uh he was once the uh cto of microsoft and he said you know the way moore's law uh, occurs in computing is really unprecedented in other walks of life uh if the boeing 747 obeyed moore's law it would have taken uh, it would travel a million miles an hour uh it would be shrunken down in size and a trip to new york would cost about five dollars um, so these enormous, his point is, I guess, these enormous, he says, these enormous changes just aren't part of our everyday experiences. They are not what we expect, right? So, uh, you know, a lot, a, a very legitimate question and a, and a very legitimate counter argument to the software is eating the world fueled by Moore's law uh, uh, thesis is that, you know, wait, uh, isn't Moore's law, you know, ending or slowing or isn't it dead already, right? Um, and if so, if that's true, isn't the software party over? Um, well, so for a number of reasons, I think that's not, uh, that, that Moore's law is not, uh, certainly not dead, um, or shall we say transistor density 
uh, uh, increases have not stopped. They are, we are doubling still at a, just a bit of, 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 uh, above a two year uh, pace, but the cost per transistor um, has not been having uh, for a number of years and in fact may go up in the, uh, in the next few. So one thing to keep in mind uh, is that it's it's really critical to understand that Moore's law applies not just to CPUs. I mean, it's measured by the leading edge, and usually that leading edge is um, uh, CPUs or now GPUs or mobile processors are the are the chips that are uh, fabricated at the leading edge. But Moore's law affects all digital processors: memory, solid state storage. Um, but with telling variations, depending on um, the two big ones are really lag, how many years behind, how many Moore's Law doublings back uh, is a particular uh, uh, chip fabricated at, um, uh, as well as the other, the other variation is cadence. So how often does it upgrade? Memory, for example, upgrades sometimes once a year, not every two years. Um, kind of there's a halfway step uh, um, in, in between, whereas um, some custom chips actually skip and don't uh, don't upgrade to the next node of Moore's law for you know they'll wait till a couple of doublings uh, take place first. So you know what I think what that means is um, uh, you know it, Moore's law applies to you know, the chips running Ethernet switches and, and, and internet routers uh, to, you know, the baseband processors in your, uh, you know, in your cell phones uh, uh, to the, you know, transceiver used to read and write data from hard drives, you know, the, uh, to digital cameras, to microcontrollers, to, you know, the guidance systems of Tomahawk cruise missiles, to the digital signal processing complex within, you know, uh, MRI machines, anything, any consumer product or weapon that we call smart, it's all software, uh, even if you can't see it or, uh, or control the app, uh, right, uh, fed by Moore's Law. And that is the ultimate force behind all incremental growth really in developing economies since 1980 um, and is clearly the biggest force still today. So on this topic, actually, uh, my colleague uh, Kevin Young did a great uh, thematic piece about um, the next generation uh, chip fabrication technologies, um, uh, for example, extreme ultraviolet lasers that have been employed for a couple of years now, but really are starting to, you know, they're really starting to do some uh, uh, amazing things with those to, to, to get even smaller, smaller feature sizes and to extend sh a horizontal shrink, you know, well into, you know, if you could talk to ASML, the company that sort of controls this, you know, it's basically until, you know, the, we'll be shrinking chips, uh, sh shrinking transistors, uh, um, you know, and, so historically, Moore's law has been driven by shrink. That's simply making the transistors and their interconnections uh, smaller, so you can cr so you can cram more of them uh, uh, onto uh, onto a chip. Uh, so we're gonna uh, whenever you see this symbol, this TR, which stands for transistor, uh, those are little sort of symbol phrase uh, that simply denotes uh, a shrink. Specifically, what we mean here is horizontal shrink. That is, when you a chip that has uh, any any kind of processor, memory, any kind of, of semiconductor chip, um, the circuit is on the surface area of the chip. So uh, the surface area, the number of transistors in that surface area determines, roughly speaking, its its computational capacity. So let's say you have this chip here on the on the left. Um, and it's got, you know, a number of sub, you know, units and things, you know, sub processors and cores, sub uh, cores and, and, and memory, they, and, and uh, very specific sort of security processors, all that kind of stuff. So then you shrink it and that's what you, that's what you get if it were a standalone chip. Usually what happens though, is that uh, the chip on the left then becomes the chip on the right. Um, and it is all, all of the circuitry and so forth and, and logic on uh, for the chip on the on the left, the previous one, um, right? That gets that gets made into, right? You can see right there, you know, it basically becomes a a, uh, a part of a larger chip. Uh, that is what usually happens, for, for example, with CPUs. Um, Bluetooth, for example, used to be a standalone chip, and now it is simply part. Uh, of your mobile processor or CPU. So in the 1950s, what we're talking about is, um, but 
you know, pretty much until until the early 60s when integrated circuits became popular. But before that, they're just standalone transistors that were placed on a circuit board to make, for example, a transistor radio or uh, the guidance system for an intercontinental ballistic missile uh, is, you know, it was, in, it was instantiated uh, in transistors on circuit boards. And that didn't work out too well. So that's one of the reasons that was one of the motivations actually uh, for putting circuits, for putting transistors onto, onto an integrated circuit uh, was the better reliability and easier uh, uh, ability to fit the computer, the guidance computer uh, uh, into, uh, into a warhead. So the 1960s saw the invention of the integrated circuit, which uh, really was, and, and the lithographic process so that you could pattern uh, these integrated circuits with greater and greater uh, uh, transistor densities and so forth and so on. So the first integrated circuits were actually custom for the military and for NASA. Uh, the first commercial avail, uh, commercially available uh, integrated circuit uh, was in 1964. They had about 120 uh, uh, transistors um, roughly, you know, uh, that was about one transistor per square millimeter. By the end of the decade, there were, a, you know, there were chips with a couple thousand um, uh, transistors. So the transistor density was, you know, probably more in the uh, uh, 10 transistors or more uh, 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 category. Those chips were actually used for th for the first uh, handheld calculators. Once they were able to get all the uh, transistors on, you know, uh, a couple of chips, they were able to build a handheld, you know, handheld calculators with, uh, with you know, very little, uh, very little circuit board. So going through this here, yeah, so in the 70s, you know, you had uh, uh, up to a thousand, you know, by the end of the decade, a thousand transistors per square millimeter. Um, you had uh, 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 chips that could be used, for, started to be used for uh, things like game controllers and the first, you know, uh, uh, assemble your own uh, PCs and even the first uh, uh, Apple uh, uh, personal computer um, were, you know, constructed out of chips with this kind of computer density. And the 1970s actually were the last time you could actually sort of see the uh, the transistors or at least the interconnects uh, on the chip. Uh, from that point on, uh, they were not, uh, you couldn't really see them with the naked eye. So 1980s, you know, we're talking about 10,000 uh, uh, transistors per square millimeter. Um, and also uh, it's a, the, the the 1980s saw the cost per transistor fall below a penny. Uh, it was actually about a hundredth of a penny by the, uh, I think the middle or so of the decade. So 1990s saw the Pentium and the, you know, from, from Intel and um, we sort of crossed the line uh, at about a hundred thousand transistors uh, per square millimeter. So the 2000s saw, you know, the million mark, million transistors per square millimeter, um, and the uh, it also saw the end of what's called Dennard scaling. So that around 2006, they could make the circuits smaller, but they were uh, no longer uh, increasingly power as, as power efficient. So the the the, the uh, how fast the chip could could you could you could fit more transistors onto a chip, but you couldn't make it run much faster, at least with silicon-based chips. So that's why we've been you know around four gigahertz or three to four gigahertz on our processors now for for well over a decade. Now, despite the end of Dennard scaling, of course, you could still cram more transistors onto a chip. So basically, what you have is you know multi-core, multi-processor uh, 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 CPUs and, and processors that are you know that have multiple individual little processors that run in parallel. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing now uh, in you know almost every mobile processor is multi-core. CPUs are all you know well above you know double digits in, in the in the number of cores that is processors, little miniature processors that are on each chip. So in 2020s, um, we see, you know, uh, it's it's we're going to see we're not quite there yet, but you know we see it's it's pretty close for with the uh, the shrinks that are that are planned uh, uh, at uh, Taiwan Semi and Samsung and Intel. Uh, uh, the uh, about a hundred million about a hundred million transistors per square millimeter. So you have chips now with with tens of billions of transistors. 
But going forward, what we see is horizontal shrinks going to get more and more expensive. You're starting to run into, you know, really some hard limits uh, in physics, which can be overcome, but it's always at what cost. Remember, Moore's law is, is also an economic. Uh, it's really it's really about economics, is is what Gordon Moore actually said. Um, so, but you know, we think that uh, that Moore's law continues by, for lack of a better term, vertical shrink. Um, that is stacking more. Uh, chips uh, on top of each other, interconnecting them and and shipping them as a single package, and they, those get in, more in more, uh, denser and denser, more chips in the in the same height over time. So that's it's basically just Moore's law, except in in the third dimension. Now, you know we've already we already have packages that are have like eight chips that are stacked eight chips, or you know uh, uh, fairly fairly you know they, they can fit into a server or other kind of circuit board. But the problem is is that uh, um, they are not uh, they have not really been commercially available yet, um, and so there's kind of some more specialized packaging. But you can see it coming. All of the company, all of the chip manufacturers, and particularly the software, the Cadence and Synopsys, the software guys who who supply the chip design software, they're all talking about 3D ICs now. That's that's uh, the software guys. That's all they can talk about. Uh, are you know they 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 you know in terms of the demand for their product, it is a big deal. So this is not just something that you know uh, we are spouting you know here sort of un, unprompted about things that might happen in the future. No, this is happening. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty confident that Moore's Law is going to be able to continue, um, you know, essentially through vertical shrink. So one of the reasons we are so optimistic, I think, about software and, and tech in general um, is because Moore's Law, though it is slowing now, is set to reaccelerate in our view. Um, and that is, you know, the idea that for decades and decades we saw, you know, a pretty regularized uh, uh, two-year transistor density doubling pace, um, but now that we're going vertical, are we going to see the same pace over again? I mean, it seems to me that most of the challenges over the decades um, were dealing with micron scale, you know, the moving from micron scale fabrication to nanoscale fabrication. All of the issues that that we have dealt with, that the industry has dealt with, in order to get there, um, now get relived in the vertical domain. I just don't think that it's going to be as challenging the second time around. Um, so I think people, I think manufacturers are going to skip ahead, um, and I think that you're going to see the pace of transistor density uh, um, increases. I, I think it's going to accelerate, um, and and so that's kind of that's kind of our uh, that's that that is our view. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is to watch the software companies, Synopsys and Cadence, the software companies that uh, uh, supply the software used to design chips, chip design software. They're all talking about 3D ICs. They're a great leading indicator to figure out what's going to happen because their customers are now designing chips three, four years down the road, and they are uh, touting uh, 3D ICs, 3D, 3D chips, what we're talking about here, as one of the primary drivers. So I think that there is you know, some, some decent solid evidence right now uh, that this is the way it's going to go. And you know, uh, I, I do believe that it's it's kind of hard not to see it uh, actually accelerate, uh, Moore's Law accelerate, um, you know, transistor density, though not measured in, you know, transistor density per millimeter square, but now per millimeter cubed, right? So um, I think that's probably the only meaningful change. Uh, and, you know, I think that's, you're going to see, as you see Moore's Law accelerate, that just gives software a much larger canvas and a much cheaper canvas uh, for which to operate.